Good morning, everybody. Welcome to The Lore You Know with Sarah Stewart and myself, Jeremy Hochalter. Today we're talking about the Scarred Lands and more specifically, the, the Divine. Divine War. Yay. The Divine War. We've, we've been kind of hinting at this yeah. all the, the entire time because it's like the big deal. And it is the what, big what, deal. What makes Scarred Lands so special? Right. And Because um, we talked about the creation of the world. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the dragons. Yeah. We talked about the Silurians. Yay. Um, and we hinted every every time you would bring up the Divine War. Right. Because that's like kind of the big central thing. So um, what I implied before, like the, the gods and the titans had gotten together and took out the Silurians, but there'd been tension between the gods and the titans pretty much from day one when the gods were created by the titans. Um, the... Uh, the story goes the Titans were very abusive to them, particularly. Um, I think it was particularly some of the Titans were very abusive to some of the some of their kids. Um, uh, uh, or I don't know. I'm going to get this right this time because last time, right at the end, I caught this. Right. I blame allergy medicine that I <laughs> when I was talking about Gormoth for whatever reason I said Chardoon and I. And that was, and I caught it like right as we stopped recording. I was like, yeah, what did I do? Right after this. <laughs> Gormoth is Chardon's dad. <laughs> um, and he's the one who, his girlfriend, Mormo, or not girlfriend, I don't even know what their relationship was. They had a bunch of kids. Right. But yet they had a very, a very, very bad relationship. And she like tortured him with, with worms that were probably still racing worms. So they, they were, they were mean to each other. They were mean to their kids. So, and they had, the, they had, uh, they actually only had one kid together, which was Chardoon, but Mormo had a bunch more kids beyond beyond uh, beyond being with Gormont. So they had only only one kid together. But um but Mormo was a touch and go not so great mom and uh Lethane, not so great mom. <laughs> she was pretty awful and she had she had two of the gods' kids. Um uh really the only mom who was kinda nice was Denev, which admittedly she had a lot of kids too, so and Mezos touch and go possibly pretty abusive in there too so abusive parents and plus the ones that weren't their parents just gave them shit too because they were bigger and meaner and, and all of that so like everybody hated it Gorak wasn't anybody's parent but he was just an asshole beat everything up and destroy all their, destroy all their toys and cat them and what so gods eventually were like we've got to stop these guys um, but it was kind of a long lead up, you know, there were little spats, there were little issues, but it was never, never pushed all out war, but the writing was on the table. Like the, the, the dragons were like, something's going to go down. We're leaving. <laughs> Goodbye. <Right. laughs> they were like, we got to get these slurry scenes out of here. So they don't pick the wrong side, like get them out. And I feel like when and, like hosts of dragons leave your continent yeah. and fly away, <laughs> you should be like, Hmm. But they did most. They did it. They left Galspad in secret, so most people didn't notice them leave. Um, I, I feel they, like but, I, I, I get that that's the idea, but <laughs> when a dragon disappears, <laughs> yeah, you, you'd think people would hmm. notice. And, and I can imagine, at least from Termana, they would be leaving in like right. It's like, where, it's like geese, you know, dragons. <laughs> like, you just don't want them on? to crap on you as they fly over. <laughs> no, <laughs> or like burn a random village down or something like that. Yeah, these are bad enough. Right. <laughs> Sorry for derailing on that one. Anyway, back really. To anyway, so so all this happens. So so this is definite. This prep, and there's this implication that the gods got together in sort of a, a council on occasion, or or the major ones, or most of the major ones, maybe some of the minor ones would get together and discuss things and some kind of neutral territory because the gods mostly only got around got along with each other because they had a mutual enemy <laughs> because right? the gods have issues with each other because just just in terms of morality and alignment you know madriel and bellsmith the twin sisters did not get along so well yeah not so much so so they, they would get together in these councils and I and I implied before I talked about Arcanthus before, which is one of the one of those councils when he was like, no, we shouldn't go to war, try to be neutral. And then Bengal and and uh, Matt and Bengal and Bellsmith and Chardoon killed him, ripped him up. So that happened before the war, but leading up to it in one of those council meetings. And the other thing that happened, and this is this is talked about in the final book, in the final book that was public, published in two thousand four. Um, was that they made a, a, this device 
um, called the Seraphic Engine, which is this kind of what the bark is that or this weird thing. And it was like this interdimensional, complicated thing where they, they got all these minds of genius engineers together with the idea of how can we take away the Titans' power? How can we sever them from their power so that we can actually defeat them? So they, they created this thing and they were really hesitant, should we use it? Because it was very much the like nuclear kind of yeah. threat here of <laughs> like do we use and it did were the Titans aware that they built it too, which is which is debatable. Uh, and where did they build it? And and that's evident that they built it on top of Mount Mount Namul on the continent of Asherak. Mount Namul is like like if you if you're familiar with Discworld and there's that huge mountain in the middle of the pl- like in the middle of the disc well, Skarn is a sphere, there's this huge mountain <laughs> in the middle of a continent that goes off into the sky, like, like, it's it's in the middle of a mountain range, so it's not like it's just solo on its right. own mountain doom, but it's still so far above anything Pretty else in the there. range. It's like that that one one skyscraper in Dubai that's, like, bigger than everything around yeah. it, um, even though there's a bunch of bigger things around it, it's, it's like that. And it's apparently flat-topped, and it, it, despite being, like, like uh, the top is almost interplanar it's it, weird stuff's going on up there and that's where the titans get together to birth the major gods so two titans would get to, or that's the implication at least some of the gods um they get together and go, we're gonna make a god and we're gonna go up here and we're gonna do something <laughs> right? it's not clear do the do or throw our magic together in a bucket and <laughs> see what happens i don't know it's not clear how because sometimes like what it, did it there always was a lady god involved, but there wasn't always a gent god involved. So. That's fair. <laughs> St. Keely's parents were, uh... <laughs> but then again, you know, you can you can change forms and who knows and what's what not. So, and and I just can't imagine, honestly, um, uh, Gormoth and Mormo doing the do. It would be it would be the hate do. It would be very, <laughs> very, very angry do. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> fair. Explain a lot. <laughs> So, so, that, so, so they get together in Mount, in Mount Namul, this mountain. So that's kind of logically where the gods get together to make to do their councils, probably, and definitely to build this engine. Um, and how the events unfold, there's, there's a couple of references to the Seraphic engine. There's a lot that imply that it happened at the beginning of the war, like that it maybe have triggered the, not necessarily triggered the war, but triggered the fighting, not the cause, but the fighting. Right. There's, there's one reference that it says toward the end of the war, but honestly, that doesn't make sense to me because the destruction that that entailed just doesn't make sense that it would be at the end of the war because so much else was going on and there would be no reason to use it because you've defeated all the Titans. Right. So it, it doesn't map. So I'm, I'm pretty sure it happens at the beginning of the war and that one reference is just wrong. <laughs> Which is fine. It happens. Or it could be like, or it could be like somebody got some, some like Sage and Asherak had their book wrong or something like that or you know whatever but it, it pretty much is clear that it happened in the beginning of the war um now what why they used it and why they why they go to war a lot of a lot of different things imply that happened but the the most of the lore talks about one trigger that kind of made them go it, they've gone too far yeah. <laughs> and it's all in keely and of course it's all down to the trickster god <laughs> keely <laughs> and keely goes and and decides to fuck with meza it's like I said, do the do, and yet here I'm saying, fuck. There we go. <laughs> so she just messed with the Mezos, and it's like I'm going to steal his magic cloak for reason because I'm a dick. Because so, right? Because so when Keely goes and steals Mezos' magic cloak, and Mezos this is like you know think think like um, Doctor Strange, you know, with the cloak that's sort of self-aware and does all the things. So so Mezos, six-armed magical titan, has this magic cloak. Keely snags it. Um, and Mezos gets wind that it's Achille that did it, gets very upset, and takes away Achille's power of being a god. Now, if any titan could do this, it's probably Mezos. Mezos is it's his epoch, and so he's already the most powerful titan at that point, and also he's a titan of magic, so he's like in tune to stuff that a lot of the other titans just wouldn't have, kind of, isn't outside of their sphere of influence, it's not within their domain. So takes away all of the power that makes Achille an uber god 
and and basically severs his connection to his followers or her followers, their followers. And, and Keely goes to the rest of the gods and says, no, <laughs> we can't do this. We can't, if they can do this, we can't fight them. We can't let this happen. If they can just boom and take away our powers, we're screwed. And the gods were like, yeah, this is going too far. So that's when they were like, we've got to take out Mezos. And that was sort of the deciding factor. Now, did they kill Mezos? Did they attack Mezos before or after using the Seraphic engine? That's a debate. Um, my thought could be that they use the Seraphic Engine, Mezos shows up going, what the hell did you just do? <laughs> and I they fight Mezos. felt something <laughs> over here. Or, or, or they, they, they attacked Mezos, the rest of the Titans go to, go to Asherak going, what, who did, what did you just do? You killed Mezos, and they turned on, turned on the engine. But clearly, I think they've one followed the other, which exact order, a bit fuzzy. I, I th I, in my mind, it makes maps to me that Seraphic Engine first, because they've got to weaken Mezos. How did they weaken him? Right. He's so powerful. Um, but we know that some that he was drawn to to where they were, and they basically ambushed him. And and I don't know if I put the picture up, but all all of the all of the what became the Victor Gods, all the major gods, um, or the major eight, the gate as we call them, got together and pounced on him and destroyed him. Now, this destruction, um, because of what Mazos is made out of, he's, he's, he's basically raw magic. So um, there isn't like a physical form left behind. You can't kill a titan, per se. Right. You can only, they can either um, entomb one, like, like chain one up, or you can kind of sunder them. But their bits are still alive. Horrible, when you think about it. Um, and the sundering of Mazos basically just shatters magic. And so Mazos doesn't just sort of like, you know, oh, there's an arm here and an eye there or whatever, <laughs> like some of the other Titans. But it just, it just explodes in magic that covers the whole globe. And the magic, instead of like being recoverable easily, it kind of gets absorbed into things all across the planet. And um, the next generation, there's a lot of sorcerers born, to say the least. <laughs> um, and a lot of people just suddenly like, I have magic all of a right? sudden. <laughs> this is magic just sort of seeds the whole planet. Um, but then that shockwave hit, but, and this is why I think it ties in well with the engine, because a lot of, the, the use of the seraphic engine was very verboten, <laughs> it was a very bad thing, and when they triggered this thing, it was on for half a second. I mean, it was not on long before somebody's like, bad idea, bad idea, turn it off. <laughs> um, to turn it on, and it sunders the titans from Skarnet, it works for a millisecond but it also the problem is you separate the titans from scarn and you separate scarn from itself right and if they left that thing on the planet itself would have exploded like would have just shattered and so they turn it off the shock wave of having to turn it off so quickly or turning it on in the first place creates another giant explosion which takes out a continent yeah it killed several gods several minor gods who have who are there helping build the thing um, and wounds others, like it wounds, we know it wounds the goddess of magic, um, and, uh, and b b they, like, they teleport out and then teleport back, like, what just happened, you know? um, and it kills all the engineers who work on it, the whole thing just sort of explodes, it takes off the mountain range that is around Namul. Namul survives, kind of, it turns yeah. into a big mountain, like a pillar, <laughs> or it just shatters the edges of it, um, and takes off half the continent. So Asherak, which was this big kind of more Gelsbatty, termana y looking continent, becomes this skinny thing um, with like bulbous ends, like an hourglass, and this mountain range in the middle, and it creates fissures and and deserts. So basically, half the continent just becomes desert now and destroys everything. And the shockwave again covers across the planet, but mostly contained. You know, the oceans kind of calm it down. Imagine some. Waves and tsunamis probably hit, <laughs> but this this is the triggering event of the divine war. At that point, like everybody's like, something just happened, <laughs> and across the world, you know. So that's that why it maps to me that because the gods feel really bad because Asherak as a continent was where was there was the kind of the home. It's called the cradle of the gods for a reason. It's where divine worship began. It's where a lot of races began and then migrated to the other continent. 
certainly where the humans began. It's probably where the elves and halflings began. Um, and uh, they, they, they went, eventually got to, you know, over the course of millions, of, hundreds of thousands of millions of years, they made it to Gelsbad, they made it to the other continents. But the followers of the gods in Asherak were way more devout. You know, you didn't, you didn't have druid cults in Asherak. They were all 100% behind the gods, just about, well, not 100%, but like way more than any other area where various druids and folks had power. And to the point where a lot of the leaders of the, of the various nations in Asherak were actually demigods. You know, they were, they were honest to goodness, children of the gods or descendants of the gods in some way. And millions of people died in that explosion. So the gods felt really bad about it. Like, oops, <laughs> didn't know that would happen. And, and spent a bunch of time there just trying to clean up and patch up and save people. You know, imagine Madriel running around right after that going, patching wounds, <laughs> put the fire out, you know, and, and, and a lot of that happening. Um, and, 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 and so again, the way I picture it is, is you, you, like, they get wind, the, the Titans get wind, this is happening, because a lot of it is described as you see coming toward Ashrak over the ocean is, is Cadam and Churn, or I'm walking across the ocean, like, we're gonna get you, and they turn it on, and they're like, no, never mind. <laughs> boom. Oh, I left something <laughs> on the stove, I'll be back. Yeah, <laughs> boom. So, and the engine itself, when they turn it back off again, explodes and is lost um it just shatters and who knows where it it went um and one of the other things this happens is the stars fall from the sky <laughs> which this is so so shattering that that's probably what causes the stars to fall i'm so big big dude. and and my thought is tying it so close to the death of mesos makes sense because the gods don't kind of want to know it was their fault <laughs> So they can be like, well, when we killed Mezos, that's what caused all the people to die. Yeah. <laughs> Not turning on that thing that no one is going to know that ever existed. Because <laughs> the, the engine itself is this big secret. Also, if should somehow it get rebuilt, or people find the blueprints, or people find pieces of it when it exploded and rebuild it, that could destroy the planet. And say maybe... Youth React got their hands on it. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> that would be bad. Right? <laughs> so they don't want people to even know it was a thing. So so tying in, and that makes sense to me in terms of politically what the gods would have said of like, what caused that big explosion? It was the Titans and defeating Mesos. So that was the first, those were the first big, big incidences. And after that, pretty much it's on. And the the after the gods kind of patch up Ashrak and Ashrak really at that point after that pretty much stays out of the war because they're licking their wounds for the next 100, 200, 300 years. Um, you could see, argue they're still licking their wounds right. now and 200 years later. Um, pretty much the battlefront moves to Galspad and Germana. Um, and because uh, who cares about the Fenrir? Like there's nothing going on there and the and dragons have kind of, nope, you're not coming down here. So those two continents are where the bulk of the war takes place um, after that. And um, one by one, the gods go and def and fight their parent titans. Um, but in the middle of that, the gods have gathered up all of their followers in ginormous armies. And believe me, some of these gods are really good at rallying their troops. Um, in fact, before the war, it's like rewind a little bit. What was happening in Galspat before this madness? Um, Chardun, the lawful evil god of slavery and, and chains and just uh, uh, conquering, basically, in a way that kind of the other gods sort of failed to do, had created this, this um, these followers, these dwarven followers, called the, called the Charduni dwarves. He basically modified dwarves into dark dwarves. And they started on Termana, but through some means, I'm guessing probably some kind of magical gate, um, they started conquering um, Gelspad, starting on the farthest west coast and just tromping their way east across the continent. And at the start of the war, they conquered like three quarters of Gelsbad <laughs> at the start of the war. It was like the north corner was, was pretty much okay, but they'd, they'd conquered their way across Gelsbad. And when the gods were like, no, we got to fight the Titans now, Chardon is basically like, 
I wanted to switch your focus. I know Conquer Girl Spot's been fun, but now you're gonna fight the Titans. And I was like, yes, sir. Um, and and the Chardini War just drops, just ends, boom, right there. And the rest of Galspot's like, oh, I guess we're allying with these guys now. <laughs> and suddenly, these dark dwarves who they were allied with are suddenly on the front lines in the in the war. And they're and the 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 good the followers of the good gods are suddenly allying with the followers of the bad gods because the titans are worse and and old um old arguments have just stopped for 60 something years so they could fight this war. and boom <laughs> there they go so so in addition to like the big battles you you hear about you know the defeat of Katam or whatever and these all those big battles but you also have all of these little or moderate battles throughout that time period of mortals fighting titan spawn and demons and monsters and whatnot and the crazy thing is the demons mostly on the side of the gods <laughs> but but there's still some that are on the side of the titans so you've got sorts of creatures on both sides duking it out um in various battlefields across those two continents um and you hear about gelspad most of the big big battles take place on gelspad um, Termana wasn't, uh, was, it's much more jungly, much less, um, urban. Um, Northern Termana is, was fairly urban, but there's a huge, like, I think, uh, uh, Brazilian rainforests, you know, right. Sub-Saharan Africa. Much harder to jungles. put your yeah. army yeah, through. Yeah, because yeah, his <clears throat> Termana is more, uh, tropical, equatorial climate. Um, so it wasn't like urbanized. It wasn't like conquered, so to speak. Um, so a good half that continent really didn't have on it except trees. <laughs> um, so, uh, so most and one like Galspad, which had been conquered top to bottom and left to right multiple times by multiple empires over right. the course of the year. So most of most of the people, most of the civilization happens there, and other than Asherak, which again, not in, not, not really part part of the thing anymore um so there a lot of it, what takes place is in Galespad. i like to think that that's kind of the that the continents were discovered was every started in ashrak and found Galespad and then later from termon um which is why termon is kind of the least inhabited even though it's the biggest well post-war biggest continent ashrak may have been bigger we don't know <laughs> also they didn't give a good they don't have a good time they don't have a good grid in that book so it's really hard to tell what they yeah so, over the course of the war, you have a whole mess of battles. Um, you want me to just some of them? Sure. Some of them are really cool. Some are really cool. Some of them are really vague. Um, I have struggled to come up with the order. We know I see Mazos was first. We know who the last few. The middle is fuzzy. Um, kind of give a sense of where some of the order took place, just because so and so is referenced as already defeated during the defeat of such and such. But uh, the exact order, the exact time and dates um, are, are fuzzy also. The Little stars walking. fell from the sky. It's really the calendar right. at this point. We know when the war started. Well, you know, we've, got, we've got that pegged down to a year. We've got a vague sense of when we think the war ended, what that year was. But stuff happens. Time goes wacky. Seasons get messed up. Um, a lot of the Mezos's magic explosion and various magic that gets thrown around during various battles pretty much screws everything. Because not only are the Titans and the gods duking it out, but you've got these heroes, these mythic legends of all of those heroes of Skarn who, like, think every epic level character ever has, you know, beat, beating each other up. You know, so so your, your traditional... D and D Uber guys who all the spells are named after. <laughs> um, look, it's it's you know Leomund and his tiny hut. Well, he, there is no Leomund on Skarn, but there was somebody like that right. during the war, and and so you've got all these, you know, in D and D scale, these thirtieth level heroes running around, epic level heroes, um, running around in the war as well, and most of them die during the war, um, and millions of people die during the war. So let's see. In, in order, we know one of the earliest ones was um, Golthaga. Um, I got a reference here. Um, I don't know if he was right after Mezos or how far after, Mezos. but um, 
we know he was before some other ones because um, Corian uh, Kalthaga is uh, the, the Forge Titan. Not a parent of any of the gods. He made it. He made the giants. He may have made the dwarves, um, but he didn't create any of the gods. So he's one of the few titans who didn't doesn't involve the creation of the gods directly. Um, but he, uh, Corian, as the god of smiths, um, had that kinship with him because he's a titan of smiths, god of smiths. While they're not related, Corian felt that it was his responsibility, his on Detra or whatever his reasoning to take out gold. And before he does this, he makes this this mithril golem, which you hear about a lot. He makes this golem to be like, you're gonna go do things while I'm doing this. <laughs> and you're gonna go be me for a while, because I know taking out Golthaga is gonna take some um, And he goes to where Golthaga's pretty much got his forge set up, which is on the east coast of Galspat somewhere. Kind of vague exactly where, but where, based on where the battle takes place, um, and based on the fact that if he's the Titan of the Dwarves, kind of in that area of Barak Torn on Eastern Galesbed, um, south of that maybe, um, and Corian sneaked, and there's this poem in Defining the Defeated that described this. It's the only one that kind of in this big poem way, so it's pretty big. This is one of the ones there's no eyewitnesses for. Um, it's just the two of them duking it out. Maybe, you know, maybe there were some giants in the distance like, oh, that looks bad. Let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there aren't like people in the, like a lot of the battles, there were people on the ground fighting too. And yeah. there's not really witnesses for this one. But the, the implication is Corian snuck in some parts. Corian sneaks, he's a paladin, but <laughs> snuck into his, his forge, builds himself a sword that he names Honor out of uh, Galthaga's own equipment, and then goes and battles them. And you know, the Galthaga comes back and they and they fight it out. And Galthaga, I think this is toward the beginning of the war because Galthaga, the poem goes that he heard the cries of his brethren and started to get worried. So to me, that that may, probably means he's heard felt the seraphic engine go, started to get worried. And I think that and that's why I place this toward the beginning of the war because um, like he hadn't engaged yet and he doesn't really get a chance to engage his his followers certainly do, but he doesn't organized much so i think this is not long after after that happened maybe he's like here's some giants go do the thing and and he's he's starting to get his stuff together corian sneaks his forge puzzle sword comes back out they they fight it out um you can see the scar across Kelspad. there's this thing called corian's cleft which was corian's sword coming down and putting a crack in the middle of the land um and eventually he uh i want to get it right he got some in two. And this is this is like kind of a classic move. This happens a couple of times in the war, where they they do kind of this vertical slice <laughs> of cutting a titan in two, and basically, you know, left side over here, right, right. side over there. <laughs> and you know, in, in the movies and everything, at that point, you know, they slowly <laughs> apart yeah, they don't, and they don't die. Go back together again, you know, and, but and, not for this yeah. guy. He's still alive. Not for He's still alive. <laughs> and um, it's described that he took the two halves and buried them in hospitable, inhospitable locations on opposite ends of the planet. Um, this this goes back to my theory that he probably put one side on the North Pole, one side of the South Pole. Right. Um, there's some convenient crevices he could have hucked them down. <laughs> um, although, should he reforge and kind of split the middle of the earth, that would be bad. But, um, <laughs> um, and this is another thing the legends stipulate that how do you bring Galthaga back and a lot of it because every nearly every one of these titans has some kind of cult trying to bring them back right their titan spawn and there's these giants who are looking to try to bring daddy back the dwarves are like no <laughs> but the giants loved him for reasons and they um the mythology stipulates that while they love to find his body that it's not his body they think they can do it with but his anvil and hammer tongue that his power isn't wasn't in his body but in his instruments. So should they find those, they could reforge, somehow reforge the Titan, bring his essence back in. So um, and theoretically, I think Corian, I think Corian split the anvil and took took the hammer and tongs, um, or destroyed them in a way. Or I don't think he can destroy them, but whatever, he's got them hidden away somewhere. Somewhere. So. There's that. So if you want, like, Titan Spawn to be like, right. we have word where the tongs might be. Because you know? <laughs> there's, there's 
there's always that underlying sense that there's Titan spawn running around trying to find their Titan spawn. Yeah. Yeah. So I had that one as pretty early. Um, next one I have is fairly early um, is uh, Hrynruk. Um I have that early for my own canon's sake, uh, <laughs> actually, um, because of what triggers them to go after him. Um, so I don't know if, if he would actually fall this early in a general sense. But he, um, Renruk is the uh, dude bro <laughs> of the Titans. Did I make you? <laughs> I shouldn't have said that when you're drinking. Right? <laughs> he is, he, he, dude bro. <laughs> he's, like, he's like the douchebag. <laughs> just just yeah. like horrible guy. He's in a way the most human. He's certainly the most human looking. <laughs> um, but he's, he's, he's a, he's a total douche. He's, he's the hunter and he, he tromps around Titan, around, uh, Skarn hunting things and being a overall just kind of horrible right. person. Did we talk and, about this on air about, yeah, we him, talked about this him creating the, the ter Tarrasque or was that off the air? Yeah. Yeah. He, I don't know if we talked about it on air, but, but yeah, he, he that's one of the stories is that he created the Trask just to have a hunting buddy. Right. And, and yeah. And who does that? Years or so, yeah. Who does that? <laughs> it's, that's, that's totally in right. So like all of the Titans spawn that are kind of huntery monstrous or most of those are, are probably his. Um, I think it's city and hound. I want to say is from, right. um, so I think it's big, giant, scary death hounds. <laughs> so, and various things like that. Um, Tannel, the goddess of the hunt, daughter, um, has issues. <laughs> Why do I think he's so horrible? Um, when uh, he raped her, and um, when she was younger, and they had a child together, Hydra, the goddess of sluttiness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Hydra's a little messed up, but I don't, I'm not going to get into her. But yeah. uh, she, she pretty much stays out of the war, though, because Tano's like, I want to keep you safe. Go into heaven and don't go. <laughs> Come out later. Um, but Tano... Um, big in the battles, um, uh, in the, and her thing is, I'm going to take out my dad. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it wasn't Tannel that triggered the fight. And this is what makes me tie into the, when this occurred. Because Hrynruk, in one of his, he, he kind of was like flipping about the war. He's like, oh yeah, yeah, the other Titans are fighting the guy. I don't care. I'm not really against the gods. They're fine. Some of them are sexy, you know. <laughs> I don't have problems with them. They, they don't have problems with me. Yeah, great, you know. And he I'm actually, great. And he thinks that Tannel actually likes him. <laughs> like, despite his abusiveness. I'm making Scar and, great again. It's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's pretty <laughs> awful. <laughs> like, I'm trying to remember who Tal's mom is. Um, I don't have a list of who Tal's mom is. I want to say it's Denev. Um, I think it's Denev. Um, but, uh, yeah, so he... He is just sort of hanging out, thinking, not that, uh, whatever, that's happening over there. It's not bothering me. And he's just off hunting one day, and he accidentally kills a goddess. <laughs> Or maybe these he didn't things happen. Like, right. Because these things happen. And my thought was, um, and this goddess is Miradim. Mir Miradim, I think, how do you hmm. pronounce it? Um, and my thought is why I put this in the order. Because she, as, she's a goddess of magic, and uh, Hadrada's daughter. And my thought is that she may have been involved, it makes sense that she would have been involved in the construction of the Seraphic Engine. Um, as a goddess of magic, and how heavily into magic that was. And she was vulnerable in some way that her put the drop on her. So me, probably more head y I don't have a lot of evidence behind this, but the idea that how could he just so easily have killed her? Um, and it seemed to be a casual like accident that he killed her. It wasn't didn't seem intentional. Um, you can't kill a god that easily, <laughs> you know, unless she was already unless she had been thrown by the engine landed somewhere severely wounded and he's like oh look there's a thing oh is that a goddess you know <laughs> and either way he kills her her father hadrada gets caught wind of this and he's like hernrex has gotta go down <laughs> so he is very upset understandably and, and tennel's all like, like oh, no no we should no, no, okay no. yes yes let's do that <laughs> <laughs> so, so so hadrada and tannel go after her. And um, eventually, uh, Tannel, being a trickster goddess, goes up and she's like, Daddy, I've always loved you. <laughs> and he's like, oh, I know you did. 
And and she distracts him and steals his bow, um, which is, I think, where his power, one of the places where his power lies. And she wrestles it to her will, whatever that means. And he does, he, he basically severs his connection to his mega weapon. And then enabling her um, and Adrada to basically beat him up and she cuts his head off. Or his head off. Um, and Adrada's like, good, good job, see you later. <laughs> and she's like, I this. And then the body stands up <laughs> yeah. and starts mucking about. And she's like, this is bad. <laughs> so, um, Corian and Vangle show up and they're like, maybe we should do something. And they hack him up into tiny bits, the three yeah. of them, and she buries them all over the place. But his like blood and viscera fall over the place. And this is this happens in central um Galspad somewhere. It's not again I'm not hundred percent sure where, but there's a lot of maybe it might it's actually might be the I'm not sure. Um don't quote me on that. I'd have to double check that one. Um but uh it happens in Galspad, and we know that much. And she buries his bits all over the place, um, to try to keep them from reforming back into nasty dad. Um I don't know what she does with the head, but I think she takes the head somewhere. Um, and but but later on, various creatures find some of those bits, and start using them or worshiping them or whatever. So, uh, Rinrik viscera is a thing you can find. In <laughs> right? Yay. Yeah, it's, it's one of one of the one of the first titans whose viscera is accessible <laughs> and, and is used by things um, and so. i think it also makes sense for as far as your timeline goes headwise like um because they didn't really know at this point that yeah he was going to stand yeah. back up until he did because mesos exploded yeah and 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 and, and corian took care of Galvanus, right. so I, right. I think that's why i place him pretty early in the that, that it maps to me that it would because they don't make that mistake later with Mor so it's definitely before Mormo's defeat right. um, and and by that point we got a little bit of solid more solid um, so that's my thought of like that Hrenruk's pretty early and it's not as damaging as some of the later defeats are um, um, and now, now I've got one, two, three five titans who were pretty much I don't know the order so I'm just going to go through them in sure. order I got them down. I, I these are um, a lot of them are described as during the height of the war. Yeah. So presumably battles part. happened before that. You know the middle part. Um, but I think the the most famous defeat in my in many ways, at least in terms of one of the first ones you hear about when you start reading, is Cadam, um, because it just says the biggest impression on all of Skarn because it's where the Blood Sea comes from. Right. I mean, just the whole you know right side of the yeah. map that's colored red. <laughs> yeah, and I also think this one's fairly early. Um, well, we know it happens before some of the other ones because the Blitzies referenced. Gotcha. Um, but also uh, because the Mithril Golem's involved. And the Mithril Golem isn't mentioned in a lot of battles, so I think it's it's involved fairly early. And also, um, when it was Corian, maybe this took place while Corian was off taken out. Galthaga is when when kicks Corian's not involved in that fight, but the Golem. So... What happens with Cadam? Cadam is um, Corian's dad, but and he's the only um, god Cor that Cadam gave birth to. But um, Corian doesn't get involved in this fight, <laughs> so sorry, I'm not gonna take out my dad. Um, but uh, Bellsmith, Bellsmith, Vangel, and Chardun, the three evil gods, lawful, chaotic, neutral, evil. Um, and the way it works out is Bellsmith can shape change and she's a trickster one of the three trickster gods she changes herself to look like Cadam, <laughs> and kind of comes up to Cadam, and she's like hey and he's like whoa <laughs> <laughs> and, and he Cadam Cadam is like godzilla yeah okay this is like the best you know minus the fire breathing or whatever nuclear breath but but otherwise he's pretty much godzilla um and you know big tail colossal rubber suit thing um, <laughs> who can breathe underwater and all that <laughs> so Cadam is like dun, 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 stopping across the eastern gale spat and suddenly sees himself and he's like what's that and he's not I'd say the brightest of the titans <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I mean fair. compared to like you know Mezos is super super smart right. um, Cadam is not so smart Cadam's not known for being creating all this stuff he came in the continents early on but he's not he's not 
you know, too, too much involved. So he sees this reflection of what he thinks is himself, and he's really just like, what's that? And she sort of leads him on this merry chase around this area until the golem shows up and grabs his tail. And then um, Chardun pops up, wraps him in these magical chains. Elsimith changes back into herself. Bangle pops up. And they basically start beating the shit out of him. <laughs> and the chains are man, can't do anything. And he's trying to fight, and the golem is like grabbing the golem. And you picture the golem is probably half the size of any of these guys. Right. <laughs> but but the I think golem it is important is still... to point out that he is enor- it. Yeah, it the is golem's enormous. Like 500 feet tall. Right. <laughs> and he's still like half the size of any of this battle. And he's got the tail, and he's just like, ugh, not gonna move. And and Cadam like turns, and he just grabs the golem, and you can see. The fingerprints of Cadam in the golem's shoulder, like 200 years later, or 100 years later, there. So that happens. And then um, the Bellsmith steps up while he's dealing with, and she stabs him in the chest, cuts him open, rips out his heart. And at that point, he's severely weakened. And um, Chardun and Vangel, they pick up this giant hillside that's <laughs> in the middle of this plain grab it, chain him, take the chain and chain him to this giant boulder and Vangel lifts him up and hucks him into the ocean <laughs> and kind of aims him toward the Scarred Lands equivalent of the Marianas Trench that's this massive trench at the bottom of, of the sea, off of you know, eastern Gelsbad, very, very, very far ashore, many thousands towards kind of the middle of the ocean um, and it was a halfway point between Galspad and Termana, anyway. And he falls in the bottom of the sea, and heartless, but still alive because Titan, right. and starts bleeding. And and through, through his magic, I know Bangle's aim is of course perfect, and he ends up you know at the very bottomest of the bottom, um, you know, rolling along and then poof, down there. And Cadam is completely can't get out of these chains, and he's totally weakened, and now he's bleeding. And over the course of and and when he hits. A tsunami hits, right. and this tidal wave comes out from from where he splashes down. Because I think, like, this is a this is a asteroid <laughs> hitting the ocean. <laughs> you know, this is a sizable chunk of something right. hitting the ocean, <laughs> and he's the, he's also the earthquake mountain shaker. So even when he hits, he's still like shaking and stuff. Creates this earthquake, creates this tsunami, which is now the water is contaminated with his blood, and this blood wave, this blood tidal wave, comes out and crashes across the area and goes south to Tremana and west to Gelspad. The damage to Gelspad isn't too much because I, I guess just the way the waves dis- the waves were heading it takes some damage. It does take out um, uh, does damage some some areas, but not a lot. But to the south is the bulk, by far, and it takes out about a of the continent of Termal, just washes it out. Um, it leaves this big bloody lake in the middle. Um, so if you look at Termana, it's like the Blood Sea is almost through half, and the, the northern shore is just trashed. And there's like bloody bayous up, up in uh, one corner, and lifts lifts on the other side, and then there's a big lake in the middle, which is just yuck through through most of it. And that was Cadam's Deluge, yeah. uh, which totally just messes up everything and causes all kinds of problems. Um, and in fact, if you watched last week, yeah, they would have seen... About it. Yeah, yeah. Birthing Cyclists and, and all of his other things. It's time. Oh, um, your audio's cutting out. Sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Don't know what... Turn my head wrong. <laughs> Internet problems. Probably right. internet problems. <laughs> My housemates woke up and they're starting to play videos. <laughs> <laughs> That's all they do all day. Um, at least on a Sunday. <laughs> they usually sleep in until at least two. Um, okay. <laughs> so, so, uh, so anyway, Calvin Zellius, all sorts of bad stuff. Um, where this happens in the war again, it could be after some of the other battles I'm going to mention. Um, uh, not clear. But we know what happens before before churn, so I know that much at least. Um, next one I talk about Cat. I talk about Kata, um, Gorak, um, the the second grossest Titan. <laughs> <laughs> like, like when I, I categories Titan in terms of gross level, Ka- Ka- Gorak is number two. <laughs> so wait, which one's the grossest? Churn. Oh, I thought <laughs> Frenric like, would be up there. <laughs> Frenric 
they're probably up there for different reasons. Right. Um, but G- Gorak is the titan of gluttony, um, and he uh, is just this big, bulbous thing. And not 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 because of the weight issues, but because of the stuffing his face with everything issues. Yeah. Um, just, he's gross in terms of of his attitude, really. Um, uh, and just his his just just doesn't give a shit about anything or anyone. Um, and one of one of only two titans who didn't have any godchildren. One of the only titans who didn't have any children. Period. Like he doesn't make things. <laughs> he doesn't care. He just eats things. And just if he did, things. there was no evidence because he just ate it. So he did everything. So, <laughs> so he might like. There's some. Yeah. Like like he made made something just to like give me the food. You know. And he's just horrible. And his main thing is he's got these just these teeth, which I don't think they get across in the art just how big these teeth are and he's also described in the text as having the these just massive incisors and the art doesn't show any of his teeth being bigger than any other teeth so um i don't th- i think the art really does him justice because i think he had some massive bangs or something like that but um he was tromping around by uh, gelspad and kind of the their western gelspad at least that's what the battle ends and he finds this forest of these cool dark wood trees and just starts nomming on them like, you know, little french fries. <laughs> and Denev is very upset. And and Denev joined the side of the Titan, uh, the side of the gods against her brethren Titans, I think because of Gorak. I can see <laughs> Honestly. That. <laughs> <laughs> she just hated him so much. And it's like, I'm not, I'm, I'm siding on the gods because he destroys my stuff more than anyone. And he had previously, he'd eaten... Um, one of the moons he'd eaten all life off of when it becomes, Bel- becomes Belsen's moon. Um, he and, I, and mythology's fuzzy was that during the war, I think it was probably millions of years before the war, like before the epoch. But um, and and he, but anyway, at this point, he's just nomin on this forest trees, and Denna's like, no, and um, she goes to stop him, brings Denna, Tanel, and Corian go with her gonna be after Corian's taken out Thaga um, and after Tannel's taken out Hrnruk both available for this right? <laughs> and um, they're uh, they're her kids so there's that too um, and they're like sure mom we'll help you take out the thing you hate so much and uh, and they go uh, yeah and they go to, to take out Gorak and one of the things she does is they hold him down and Denim just goes in and starts yanking out his teeth. And it's just this is this is kind of where his power is. And she just pulls out his teeth, throws them like over her shoulder, and she's just pulling out all of these teeth. And these teeth are just shattering across all of Western Gelspad like rain. Right. And um, one of them, the one of the incisors, falls all the way to the very southwest corner and becomes what the city of later, many years later, becomes the city of Fangs Fall. Weird. Where they make a city around the tooth, which is this big mountain <laughs> that fell, and they build, build a, a town around it, and um, and they fall over what um, becomes the uh, name. It's on the map, um, but the, like the uh, wasteland where all these like holes are in where the teeth fell. Um, <laughs> you're looking at the map. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna read the map for the screen, and we can all look. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So where at? Sorry. Um, the northeast part. Uh, northeast. Uh, above the south. Do do do. This map is so hard to read on the screen. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Anyway, anyway, there's. Look uh, at the map. Beautiful. <laughs> oh, I, I, no, it's like making me go and get the map. Okay, I don't have it. I've got a poster of it in the other room. Like covers an entire wall. Oh, that's so awesome. Memorized by now. Yeah. Um. Uh, say the say the festering fields, but it's probably could be I festering know, fields. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's it's always an uh, they love them the uh, alliteration mm-hmm. in the Scarlands mm-hmm. books big time. <laughs> so warning marshes, uh, festering perforated fields, plains, perforated plains. That's it. The perforated plains. It? Thank you. Yeah. it's the perforated plains that I was trying to think. Perforated by the teeth. There we go. So yeah, and there's all these like whole 
stuff in there and very very dangerous and a lot of his followers ended up there um although a lot of his followers are also in the blood steps so i think he did some stuff in the blood steps too um but the big battle takes place up there and that's uh yeah so she takes a little seeth and then they take him and they bury him somewhere um own scar mountains maybe there's the, up, up north of that battlefield there's a mountain range there's, there's a mountain range up there uh, there's um, I think albadia there's, uh, no, no no to the west of that to the west of that do 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 um i'm gonna zoom in on this so it's gonna get really weird looking on the screen titan moan mountain titan moans mountain just like that um anyway that that I suspect Titan's is home. Where Titan's, Titan's home. home Titan's home. Maybe where they buried Gorak. Maybe. Um, the mythology goes that because he couldn't, he doesn't have teeth anymore. He can't eat anymore, and he starts to get really super skinny. So, um, and his followers are these, and, and that's like it's like so much fat shaming around Gorak, which, well, um, but but um, he's got these he, these uh, bulbously huge. Literally called followers. fatlings. Literally yeah. called fatlings. And then these other things, gauntlings, which are constantly ravenous and hungry. Yeah. No matter what, they, they never feel satisfied. Um, they're super emaciated. So, you know. i just like to point out, so this is what we're talking about when when discussing the power of gods. Um, so on the screen, everyone can see the perforated planes up here. And this is about where the battle took place and fang's fall is way, way down here she like she like strong arm that when she threw that incisor <laughs> that's like over half the continent half, away yeah half the continent away thousands of miles away it'll really two, make two you think away. about when you're in you, you yeah. know if you do gardening or whatever and you're out there digging things up yeah, what like, what is like <laughs> <laughs> to be an, to be an ant, ant. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I think yes, the setting be, really does that. You're just like, wow, being a mortal tennis is like being an ant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, <laughs> so, and and the fact that they built and and they they actually mine these the the teeth, and they they've been mining this teeth this this one tooth for like fifty years, um and and then, but again this is another like the rest of them got buried but the teeth got get split up and the teeth were clearly from Denev's perspective at least a lot of where his power lay so um there's these titan spawn and there's various other things seeking power looking for these teeth all over the place to use them as reagents or things in alchemy because yeah. titan pieces um are, are al al kind of so that's gorak uh, i'm gonna go next to gormoth yes there's a lot of titans whose names start G. Right. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five titans whose names start with G. There's only 13 of them, so that's a lot. <laughs> so if you get them confused, don't worry about right? it. <laughs> There's a reason. For I that. can do this, but I've been doing this for years. So, and I'm probably pronouncing everybody's names wrong. Um, Gormoth, Mouth, I, I don't know. Um, he was uh, uh, father. The he only fathered Chardoon. He's the one who who got together with with um, Mormo with possible hate sex or something. Um, who She tortured him ages ago, and he, he's called the writhing. Kind of got these weird ropes, and he's always yeah. kind of twitching and, and just badness. Um, again, some unfortunate <laughs> things around his character. Um, <laughs> like, uh, what, what year was this written? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, but anyway, he, he, he was, he was the shaper and he created life on Skarn, but, um, he went bad and went sour for the poisoning business and, um, uh, Chardoon, he boozed the crap out of him. So Chardoon's like, it's going down, dad. So at some point during the war, um, and, and Gormoth had created a whole, he, he was responsible for lot of the armies that the that the divine forces fought because he created all sorts of weird ass abominations yeah. and whatnot that they battled and a lot of the titan spawn are attributed to him and especially the weird shit like he just sent a lot of forces and so I, pretty i think it's just fairly late in the war because implications a lot of battles by then um his forces were pretty strong for a really long time so i think this happens fairly late um that uh 
the Chardoon is finally like, I need to stop him. And, and, and presumably there was many battles with him. I don't think this was the only battle. It was just the final battle. Um, and Chardoon and, and was Vangel's help or Vangel just because like, oh, Vangel, Vangel's like, I like killing Titans now. I have a taste for it. Let's go take one out. <laughs> As I believe that's actually how it went. And so these two evil gods go in and basically s sneak up and just pound him. Just, just, just kind of ambush him from right. two sides and just beat the shit out of him. And, and Vangel learned a lesson from Corian and he does the cut and twain thing yep. again. So second Titan to be cut and twain from bottom to top. Right. Left side, right side. Um and the Writhing Lord, unlike Golthaga, who's just like Bleh. um the Writhing Lord is actually trying to put himself back together because he'd already kind of been through something like this millennia before. Um and because he's this kind of Titan of of I just think of it as the Titan of Cancer in some way, because he's a sort of the Titan of like just explosive growth. Yeah. The, the fact, the idea that he could actually reforge himself, perhaps. Um, and they took his body, and they brought it somewhere, and laid each piece of it on either side of a chasm. Now, there's one speculation that it isn't even on Skarn. Now, when I look at it as you've got the. Um, the uh, lawful evil god and uh, the chaotic evil god, who in you know traditional D and D sense are usually against each other, um, chaos thing. And my theory, completely headcanon theory, no, little minimal proof of this, is that they put him on a chasm that separates hell from the abyss. Oh, oh. And and that there's maybe some kind of chasm that divides those two areas with Belsimits maybe being somewhere nearby, I guess, because hers is theoretically between the two, but but I could have easily imagined them just putting because they say it may not be on Skarn so I could see them moving into a divine realm mm -hmm. and that could be why he can't reform because such powers are there and it would make sense that they would want to keep an eye on him and it also makes sense why nope has been able to find him, because he's got a ton of worshippers, way more than a lot of the other titans, I haven't they found him there's several chasms on Skarn, and there's snow in the cave, and, and he's got these creatures and whatnot that would inevitably just spawn out of him. So if they put him in the chasm in Fenrilic, you'd think there'd be mention. Yeah. You put him in the chasm in the Dragonlands, you'd think there'd be mention. Um, you put him in any of the minor, more minor chasms in Gelsbad, there would definitely be mentioned. There's yeah. no mention. So and there's some theories, like he's buried somewhere in the Blood Steps, but there's a chasm that is massive it would need to be so that's my theory is that you know maybe between the abyss and hell or, or between two defined planes somewhere um where like a bunch of you know followers of the gods are there kind of watching it it's like these little bugs form around him and little weird creatures and abominations just sort of crawl out of his flesh and they're like nope yeah. <laughs> you don't get out you know or something I feel like that's like that. somebody's day job they just have to sit around his yeah, body and be like nope. sit around and <laughs> keep an eye on on Gormat's body as it streams that each have of it across this chasm and it's just horrible torture and did, yeah. did he deserve it it just feels pretty awful but but maps any kind of level of torture that that Bengal or Chardin would do yeah so ugh. Like it is, I think it's important to point out that like the Titan sucked really bad. Um, yeah. So does Vangle. <laughs> Vangle. But at least there's just one Vangle. So horrible. Oh, absolutely. You know, all three of the evil gods are bad, but Vangle is particularly bad. Yeah. You know, he's literally he's got like bloody dreadlocks and like smells of gore. Yeah. <laughs> Flies like to hang around. Him big bloody axes you and know, i feel like he wouldn't be one to just like let that like wash off or whatever he's got to go out and reapply you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he's, he's he's you know think of like what's left of super bad and just super chaotic bad yeah. and super just just bad for the sake of bad because he doesn't get his power from worship like all the other gods he gets his power from battle he wants people yeah. Right. He loved the war. He got so much energy from the war. He's still living off of it 150 years later. Only now he's like, maybe we need another war. I'm right? feeling a little. I'm feeling a little. What hungry. can I do? <laughs> yeah. So he, he. Yeah. But he also knew that if, if the Titans had kept up what they were doing, and why he sided with the gods was because, um, 
it, he wouldn't get any power left if they kept going what they were doing yeah. because there needed to be things to have for because you just can't he's not a nihilist you just can't destroy everything because he's he's realistic and smart enough to know things need to be around and things still need to be born yeah. in order to fight later to give him power so it's like fight have babies over there and then they'll fight and then they, right. you know, in fact, that, that mentality is probably, and I know we'll get to this, but I think that's the mentality that is like the one thing that kept him from murdering yeah. Denev at the end. Yeah. But like, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, I, I still need, you know, we can't, we can't destroy the world. He's right. Not a, he's, it's not, he's not just destroying things for the sake of destroying things. Right. Um, so, that was, okay, Mormo. Mormo. Mormo's one of, one of my faves, and there's a lot of lore. And she's she's fun, and I think, you know, on the evil scale, I think she's actually I think consider her less horrible than a lot of the titans. Um, I also like snakes, so <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> I like snakes, <laughs> it helps. So she's she's this titan that's basically um, almost a, a colossal snake golem in some ways. Um, so there was like this ideal, this ideal miniature for. Wish I brought it. Um, let's see from the camera anyway. Um, that, that Watsi came out with ages ago. But it's a huge snake thing. Um, but um, so she's just this massive woman made of snakes. Um, and her and Denev really don't get along very much for reasons that aren't necessarily 100% clear. But um. Mormo also is gave birth to more, uh, gods than pretty much anyone. Maybe, maybe Mezos and, and maybe Dana, depending on how you count and if you count all the genie. Um, but she had uh, Madriel, Bellsmith, the two elf gods, Chardoon, and Minawi, the goddess of the sea. So she was busy. She had a lot of kids, um, and she has a lot of followers. A lot more than, uh, ten Titans do and prolific in terms of that and and followers who she actually seemed to care about um but uh and uh the hags follow her mm -hmm. um what are called the organs which you think snake-headed women but um like medusas but there's scarn has two other things called gorgons which are hum bald humans with snakes coming out of their abdomen and lion-like black icky things with snake manes because Skarn has to be different but they're called uh, uh, greater and lesser yeah. organs as well So, and there's medusas running around too um, and lots of other snake like creatures, lots of various cults too um, so Denev kind of have finally had it, had, it, had it up to here with her and there had been again a lot of battles with Mormo, she was another one it was just a lot of battles, battlefields, a lot of armies and kind of the ultimate fight with her. Um, uh, Chardon figured out a way to... Because whenever they'd fight her, and she'd just snake out and get away. And like they'd go fight her, snake out, get away. This kept happening. After multiple times, Chardon's like, we can't do that anymore because she keeps escaping. So, and then her forces... And so he figured out a way to chain her so she couldn't basically re-snake liquefy. Um, so that they could actually fight her. And so he figured out how to do that. They set it, They set up the situation. He kind of, whether it's a spell or whatever it is he does, he casts that. Um, and then, so she starts trying to poison everything. Bad reels running around going, anti-poison. <laughs> Doing her, her, ah, sun goddess thing. Um, Bell Smith is like, nah. <laughs> she just sort of stabs him back. <laughs> and Denev steps up, you know, while Bell Smith's backstabbing and all that. Denev steps up and sticks her hand in the middle of the snakes and rips her heart out. <laughs> because. Also a recurring had... theme. <laughs> also a recurring theme, you know. We get multiple heart rips out thing. And again, I look at it as maybe that's where ben Denev sees um, Mormo's source of power. Right. And then Vangel just cuts all of her little snakes up bits like way vangled this so this was a this was a major joint effort you know one titan and denev wasn't even in the death of mezos remember we said all the other gods got together denev did not get involved in that and this is um moro and gorak are really the only, only fights denev gets in. um but it's uh the chart in madriel bellsmith denev vangle the big you know all the bad guys and yeah. madriel and denev all get together take out more 
Um, and they chop her into little bits, and they just sort of rain in middle of Gelsbad in what later became, what, what at the time was called the, the lovely Broadreach Forest. <laughs> Which now is the horn soft right? <laughs> <laughs> It's the centerpiece, and it's it's pretty central to to Scarn, and annoyingly makes travel across the continent really difficult because it's such a huge landmark in the middle of the continent that is really impassable because of just all of the horrible, horrible crap that's there. Lots of monsters. It's it's almost certainly the most deadly for it, Scarn. Yeah. And you don't want the unicorns inside there to come give you hugs or anything. Yeah, because that was <laughs> all that all that Mormo stuff fell and blood and bits and snake pieces and all this, and um, mutated just tons of stuff. And as as you were just saying, the unicorns were so it was it was like it used to be this forest of like happy wood elves and happy wood dwarves <laughs> and you know there was a few hags, but it wasn't bad. It was a really nice place. You know, <laughs> and and all this stuff rains down, and and everything kind of mutates, <laughs> right. and and the unicorns turn into these serrated blades, and and all these abominate, and the trees <laughs> come to life, and they start grabbing people, and you know, trees go twisted and evil, <laughs> and like the whole forest just gets trashed. Yeah, there's um, uh, there's a lot of lore on this stuff, so keep an eye out for some potential stuff coming out yeah. in the near future nice. about, about detailing about yes. I think stuff. I think it was but, a great choice for the designers when they were like okay how do we take this forest that was this bright happy place and make it obvious that Mormo's blood just completely jacked it up we're going to take yeah. unicorns <laughs> and make them violently evil with big blades coming out of their face because why not yeah. <laughs> yeah and those 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 blades it's like a big deal to make weapons out of them um so they have they have these um these uh keepers there's these um sort of i and and Morma is interesting because she has a lot of followers in a lot of different capacity so there's a bunch of followers of Mormo who are like we need to bring mom back and they're really dedicated to bring Mormo back but then there's a bunch of other followers who are just like she's rained on where we live and we just get power from that so they're not so much interested in bringing her back as they are just using her bits to empower themselves through various ways and means um um and there's these and i'm going way off topic here but um the those unicorns actually have guardians called sentinels that like take care of them but they're batshit crazy <laughs> and they're not like evil evil they're not trying to bring marvel back maybe some of them you can play it however you want but as a whole they're just like we have we take care of these crazy unicorns because there's a bunch of other people running around who kill them for those swords for turning the, the horn and the swords and the sentinels won't have any of that because it's like those are mine <laughs> i protect them they are the they're crazy right. <laughs> they're trying to bite your head off because they're not only the serrated blade but they're also like you know deadly hooves and you know really like just mutant death unicorns right. <laughs> and they're 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 not they're, they were original lex text the original text they were called the hornsaw unicorns and the new they're just called the hornsaw just kind of simplify it um because even to call them unicorns anymore is almost misleading right um and those aren't the only there's also dryads that are messed up and nereids that are messed up to like, think any nature spirit any fae um the the elves in that forest are super messed up <laughs> um, there's dwarves in that forest who are super like like everybody's messed up and then over kind of seeing it all there's these hags and there's this one hag who's found his heart and she's trying to gather up viscera and ref and a lot of the um the serpent amphora cycle is around this whole thing of, of we want to there's this thing with viscera in it so there's a lot more lore i'd say around mormo and the a lot of the other scarns and a lot of the other types of feats um a lot to say about her so. so before we move on, uh, we had a quick question from uh, Jacques DK. So, uh, and it's a really good question. I think we touched on this, but I can't remember if this was in a previous episode or our personal conversations. Um, <laughs> why didn't like can the Titans leave Scarn, like either no. be be forced to or or choose to? Because I mean, why didn't they just leave after they were getting owned by these gods? 
as proof of using the Seraphic Engine, they are utterly tied into Skarn itself. Um, Mezos could muck about in Skarn's uh, occult planes. You know, he could he could he could wander around the astral plane or whatever. Um, but he was still tied into the astral plane that overlaps with the physical material plane of Skarn. Um, and we did talk about this in detail, like like why nobody can leave Skarn. Right. Really, not just the Titans, not the gods, not the 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 Slarasians, not the dragons. Nobody can leave Skarn. Like there is a um, thing as plane jumping, but they're really plane jumping within within a bubble. Yeah. Yeah, because you can go to Skarn's version of there's there's the occult planes, um, i.e. transitive planes, and other lore. Um, uh, that would be the astral plane, the ethereal plane, shadow plane, and then Skarn land adds the dream plane. So it's four planes. They're basically overlap with the material plane. Um, then there's the um, elemental planes, of which Skarlands actually has six. Um, so the, the the normal four plus uh, positive and ne- negative energy, um, but there again they're they're not overlapping it, but they're still completely tied in. Scarn Scarlands has its own city of brass and elemental plane of fire, so they're Scarlands' own version of them. And then there's the divine planes, which is the heavens and hells and very and limbo and various places where the gods rule, and they're again completely tied into Skarn, completely isolated. You can't cross... You can't go to Gard- to Vangle's Abyss and somehow cross it to the bigger abyss right. and go find, like, Orcus. And unless like, there's a... yeah. The, the creatures that exist there aren't even demons and devils in the way that, like, people from Forgotten Realms think about them. Like, they're Titan Spawn. No, they're demons and devils. Are they? They are demons and devils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're they are outsiders in that in that sense. Um, whether they were spirits that the gods found that they turned into demons and devils. Um, um, and if you, my theory. Of of how Scarlands got split off from the rest of the multiverse is when um, that that the idea that Scarlands is trapped right. in some kind of a bubble um, to contain the nameless orb. Um, uh, that when it was when it was bubbled, its own outer planes were bubbled with it, its own version of the outer planes. So, um, in theory, those outer planes already had things on them that already. You know, I, yeah, I like to think of it as like as like you know, Orcus is one of my one of my favorite examples because um, he's such a you know pronounced creature yeah. in um, in the traditional canon. Um, is that maybe like like this kinds of concept of Orcus gets split and then and that there's a demon by the name of Orcus <laughs> who's got goat feet who lives in in Vangel's abyss he's not super mega powerful demon right. he's just but I mean not, he's powerful but he's not you know he doesn't things necessarily because Vangel has full control over everything but he still gets in the way and stuff and maybe he wants to find the rest of him so he has a vested interest in opening this bubble that contains Skarn. Yeah. Plot idea right there. Right? <laughs> Why would the demons be against Vangal? Because they want out. You know, there's, there's... Uh, did I play with that plot point? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, maybe that. So, so and, and, and there is, there is uh, some indication that, like, uh, one of the... Um, uh, Sethris um, is another one. One of Vangal, uh, Belsimith's daughter... Sethris would that father was a demon prince. So so another indication that the demons were not Titan Spawn. Gotcha. That they're there's some there's something else. And they're also, you know, in terms of the detection and honestly, just in terms of mechanics, if you have favored enemy Titan Spawn, that would be like everything. Yeah. So <laughs> mechanics wise, we can't have demons and devils be Titan Spawn. <laughs> that would just be too much. I know there are there are demons and devils out there that are, and we'll yes. we'll go back to our actual topic here in just a moment. Yeah, there yeah, are sorry. Titan Spawn, and I guess that's where I had a conversation with someone, and I I think we had assumed that, but. Yeah, I and and there could be intermixing or interbreeding, or a demon that got got Titan goop on them and right. got turned into a Titan spawn or something. But the demons and devils are not 
as a rule created by the Titans. With, with you know, with probably a handful of exceptions, because the Titans running around and made a lot of stuff that right. could have ended up in a divine plane, like the gods themselves. So you know, arguably, you know, most of Skarn is Titan spawn. If you think right. about it that way, but but um, humans are. <laughs> Despite th- they're denying it, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're titans, but but um, but that there's there's that implication. But you know, at least in mechanics, you don't want devils to have that that trait, right? Because that, that would make rangers who have titan spawn as their favorite enemies way too powerful. So well, I mean, <laughs> it, it is. rangers kind of have to make up somehow. <laughs> so. This is true. <laughs> they're pretty 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 nerfy and uh in a uh, poor Five rangers. D, yeah, yeah. Sure. It's, I think the warlocks did too. Anyway, way off topic. What I'll go were we back talking if, about? If I don't, hopefully, hopefully, I, I add a question. Um, but yeah, titans can't leave scar. Um, and yeah, so we did more. Moment. Uh, full cost. Full cost. Full cost. Cool. I, I, I have no idea if I'm saying that one right. It's got a U in it. <laughs> um, full cost was the is the titan of fire and volcanoes and flames. He, whatnot so just picture a colossal burning ember um shaped vaguely humanoid and that's that's the whole cause the whole cause and and actually it's a perfect segue because one of the problems with cause is that he is stuck to the literally stuck to the ground because he is a titan of fire and earth way beyond any of them are and the struggle um came down uh of of how to take him out um, which, honestly, Corian spent a lot of time working on working this out, trying to be like, how do we take out Dolkos? Because he's just... Yeah, this old murder board set up. Undefeatable. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and they're like, well, okay, we had the problem. We just go... And it's kept her solid. How do we stop Dolkos from just going... And going fire lava? How do you contain that? Because yeah. they know they can't kill the Titans. They have to contain them. They have to chain them. They have to box them. They have to do something with them. And so um, he, he figured it out, you know, because Corian's big brain <laughs> figured it out in a very Corian way. <laughs> and, he, and, and this is why this is fairly late in the war, because Corian goes and I believe he gets uh, the anvil, or, or less of it, or some of the, some of the, the tools of, of Golthaga, and he goes and he basically beats... Full class with them to forge him, <laughs> and he forges full class into an enormous arrow or bolt, um, and gets Tanel to shoot him. <laughs> like, I'm not kidding. And Tanel shoots him into the sun. <laughs> which, and which means he can technically leave. Scarn itself, Scar itself, but not the but bubble. Still not, right. But not the bubble. So she shoots him into the sun. So it makes this, this like kind of breaks him off from Scarn, and she shoots him into the sun. And he re cements himself on the sun instead of on Scarn. And honestly, he loves it. it like all all lore aside, it, it, there's a lot of implication that he's like, I should have been here to begin right? with. Right? Yeah, this is so nice. <laughs> so yeah. nice. But he's still pissed that they didn't give him a choice that they didn't give him an option and and you know would he have taken the option if they had if he had known what he knows now probably but back then he didn't and he certainly wouldn't because yeah. darn those kids yeah <laughs> I'm not it's like they gave they him say. a permanent spa day and he's trying yeah. to be angry about it but he's still like mm, this is nice <laughs> okay my screen just froze so oh I'm no that you, okay, you can still see ah. i can okay well i'll just keep going um okay. that is still good so so yeah, so she shoots him in the sun. Um, there is an error in the Scarred Lance player guide. This is, this is like the biggest error I find in that book. It men- it says there's a slight gaff where it says that Rinruck is on the sun. No, it's Vulca. That makes no sense. Gotcha. Gotcha. Vulca <laughs> is on the sun. Close on. And now your video is frozen. Oh crap. Okay. <laughs> yeah, my my app just disappeared. I can still hear you, so it's up to you if you want to be frozen in time but talking oh. or if you want to what is going on here drop out and come back oh i've got oh the internet to go. yeah what's going on here discord is just being a pain um 
Yeah, uh, I think I'm going to drop out and come back. Okay. Because Discord is just completely... We will wait patiently for you. I'm worried it's going to drop entirely. If I can... Not good timing, Discord. <laughs> right, I will... Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, not a good sign. Okay, I'll be back. Okay. Ray technology. Everyone who's watching, what are you doing today? Besides watching this, anyone have a game going on later today? Hello. I hear your voice. On oh, camera. you're spinning up for video. I see you moving. It automatically connected me. That was pretty awesome. Yay! Make it big again. Uh, all right. Okay, it's working again. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so sorry about that technical difficulty. We're also been going really long. This is a long. This is a long story here. Uh, blah, 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 full cost churn. churn. All right, churn. Churn. Churn is like my second favorite um, defeat, um, and and I think the grossest titan. Um, Turn Titan of Plagues um, and Disease and Bugs. Um, I hate Bugs. Probably why I hate him so much. Um, <laughs> I, I also like to think he's the Titan of Allergies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now I know who to curse. Perfect. But it's, probably, it's probably, honestly, that's probably Mormo. But um, <laughs> if you think about it. Uh, but yeah, Ch Churn. Um, churn's churns uh, defeat is unique. Um, they had this plan. And this was this was very 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 late in the war. We you know this is well after uh, well after um, Kadam's defeat, um, and and I, it was the, the, kind of the, the the height of the war. And I think it's fairly late. Um, they had a plan. They had this whole thing in mind where the like turn was so hard to defeat for for various reasons. He get into your head. He just did. And and so they had this plan. They were they had this gate in Barak Torn that they'd created that they were gonna like, that Madriel was gonna like shove him through that would like cure him of his disease and like turn him into good or something. It was this crazy plan, right? <laughs> and, and, and there was all this like ideas and stuff and, and Madriel had it all figured out, right? It fell apart utterly. <laughs> and the the dwarves of Barak Torn and their god, um, uh, Goran, Sounds like a little bit Korean Gor Gor Goran, um, who was uh, what little we can think was maybe an up a dwarf who was uplifted to demigodhood by Korian. Um, and the uh, elves of that region, who were these mountain elves, so we had forest elves, we had sea elves, we have mountain elves. I, think, I assume we have sea elves. We have mountain elves anyway. Uh, mountain elves named uh, the Derdrandal, the Drandali, the Drandali, um, were very pale, pallid. Um, they, uh, and their god, Nathalos, who's this, like, greater god, arguably, but, um, but he didn't ha doesn't have his own divine realm. Um, they, they were allies, had been allies for a very, very long time. And it was basically ruling the Caligar Mountains together. And they had this whole big plan that they were gonna, they were gonna set up and they were gonna shove, churn through this gate. And the... Depending on who you ask, <laughs> the dwarves will say one thing, the Drindali elves will say another thing, and the scholars will say a third. But but what is what highly most likely have happened is the churn got into their heads and turned them against each other through his like poisonous, disease-ridden yuck, and turned them against each other. So the dwarves believe that the the elves betrayed them. The elves believe that the dwarves betrayed them. And they're off on this bridge, and basically the dwarves turn their back and shut the doors, leaving the elves to have to fight him. And the elves get just massacred, and their god nearly gets killed, and they 
barely keep him alive by shoving his spirit into a golem. Um, it's horrible. I, can I hear you? you somebody making noise? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. As you were so quiet, I was like, I hope I still have audio. <laughs> okay. Um, so they shove him in this body of the golem. And, and Churn is like, ha, 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 and wanders off. And he's, but he's mad because they're like, they set me up. And so while his machinations worked, he's pissed that they even tried. So he's like, I'm going to take out the rest of the elves. So he knows that there's this massive elven empire in Termana. So he just stomps his way across what is now the Blood Sea, because this is post Cadam's Fall. So he stomps his way across the Blood Sea, because he's a titan that can do that. Um, avoiding, you know, hi, Cadam. <laughs> Doing okay down there? Okay, you know. But avoids that area, but but comes across. And the, um, the uh, somebody, like, somebody alerts the elves of Termana that the churn is on his way <laughs> with with a mat on prepare and the elves of termana who are and their god um the that which abides later we learn his name is and if you read through the entire lore his name is jendavius um basically get together and build the biggest elven army ever seen um you know think lord of the rings a bit bigger um and they they basically fill the shores of the cliffs of promise which is on the uh central basically north central coast of termana um east of of uh B blood bayou the, on the other side of the big watership where the blood sea came in um and they're they basically wait for him because they know he's coming for them because he's just eight elves now and he just rises up over the cliffs and there's this massive battle but it's churn He's gotten in their heads. He screwed with them. And he got in the head. He somehow poisons Jan Davies' Herald. And when they go to attack, the Herald betrays him and basically stabs him in the back. And um, the, the god goes, Jan Davies goes down and he's just killed. And he's killed so harshly that his name is forgotten. And the memories of him are are. The, the things aren't like his the things he made are still there but the memories of him are gone and his name is wiped out so you you look at a piece of paper with a prayer on it and we pray to blank <laughs> you know just gone it's it's like the death is so final it just erases him um so the only evidence that he existed is like there's a temple to someone you know <laughs> like there's a visage that's wiped out you know just nothing huh. they know it was they know it was a guy and and um so all that happens and his high priest um, so his, 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 the, the Herald betrays him, the Herald, the Herald drops, they, they attack the Herald, and his Herald is just full of, like, churns worms and stuff, and it's just full of decay and rot, like, clearly this has been going on for a long time. And churns, meanwhile, they're just lashing around, you know, beating everybody up. Um, and, uh, Jen Davies had dropped these, like, shards that the, that the people just, they're in great despair. Their Herald died, their God died, and they're screwed. They pick up these shards, and they just rally. And the high priest manages to rally them, and they use these, char these 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 shards that become these spheres and attack churn, and they just they, they attempt to rally even as they're watching thousands of people drive. Every time churn swoops his arm, you know thousands of fighters just die. The high priest basically runs up churn's arm with one of these shards, leaps down his mouth, down his throat, and from the inside stabs him in the heart because he's Vladuin and he's badass <laughs> and he's level 30 and he can do this. He can do that, right? <laughs> and he's like one of the last heroes of the Divine War. Um, and he kills Churn. He's the only mortal to kill a Titan. I mean, he doesn't kill, kill. I mean, he, he defeats him, he stops him, he right. stabs him in the heart. And that stops him. In time for Madriel and um, Vang, well, no, Vangle, Vangle shows up as, like, turns down, he jumps, they cut him out, you know, drag, Flat and I'm dead, nearly dead. Um, and like, cure, stabilize, you know. <laughs> and like, like, no, most of the most of them are dead. You know, the the the, uh, the army is like, been annihilated nearly. And there's just a few, few hundred people left. And Fangle shows up, and he's actually Churn's son. He's the only kid Churn had, and he just sort of shows up, and he's like sad. <laughs> and what? he's just sort of like, oh, and he picks Churn up and he leaves. He doesn't do anything, and they're like, because they're like, Vangel, we don't want Vangel to rescue us, you know. And he just sort of picks Churn up and leaves, and they're like, well, I guess that was good, right? but they're just wrecked. 
and the elves are cursed because of churn. And basically, as he's in dying breath, he curses them. They cannot have children, and their eyes, the uh, the uh, whites of their eyes, turn black, and um, and they become sterile, and uh, and it just it it, and they were this massive empire. You know, at one point, that empire covered like all of Termana and in went into Gelsbad and there were like islands. It's like there was like an Atlantis continent that sunk into the sea. Like um, uh, I think Catam sunk it like millennia ago. You know, they, they were a massive continent at one point. The heart of most civilization on Skarn. And now they were down to like this, this detritus, broken people. Um, and their, their beautiful cities, you know, between Catam's deluge and Churn's curse are just wrecked and ruined population is shattered um and there's these charduni dwarves who are starting to get their shit together <laughs> like on their border so being a high elf sucks <laughs> and and they and they go through the next 150 years it's pretty bad vlado would survive though um although he just spends the next 100 and he spends the next 150 years basically locked up in the temple of that which abides which is what they call the god now um basically a, a hermit um, and then he's the he's the center point, centerpiece in the Forsaken trilogy books. So a lot of said a lot said about him. So full cool character, way overpowered. Um, <laughs> like I saw the stats. This, they actually brought stats for him about in the the uh, Forsworn in the Forsaken book, which is like this, of the Scarlands original publications. I, well, there's tons of phenomenal lore in that book. The dates are meaningless gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> I've said this before. <laughs> the dates don't map to any other calendar, and don't don't look at those dates with any kind of. They say oh, old calendar. They're not old calendar. They're some elven calendar. Don't try to make sense out of them. Um, but anyway, he 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 eventually uh, his big mission is to bring back the uh, god of the elves. Um, what when if and when that will happen in new Scarlands meta plot, no idea, but um, I'm not privy to that kind of information. <laughs> but um, but it's certainly, it's certainly a thing that can be played with in there because there's a lot there. And there were stats for him uh, in for Jim Davies himself. Um, that book um, dealt with the meta plot of his return and tying into the novels. And then um, uh, Lost Lore book, the final book that came out, actually has stats for for uh, Vladowin and Jindavius. So, and, and I was just like, Vladowin's too powerful. <laughs> and I actually nerfed my version of Vladowin because it did, did not make any sense. <laughs> How does he have 14 levels of thief? <laughs> <laughs> On top of the 20 levels of cleric and oh, who does this stuff. Um, <laughs> so, but a lot of great stories around him. Nice. So, does defeat of Churn. Um, and, and then... Uh, 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 so Vangel brought, brings him back to Gelspad, and him and Madriel bury him underneath uh, this this place called the Flourishing Flats. Um, Madriel basically creates this kind of cocoon around him that's supposed to be this d- disease preventative, leak-proof egg for his body. Um, it's not very effective as it's not very leak-proof. <laughs> And within the next uh, 10 years or so starts to, at least at a molecular level. And uh, between that and the water coming from the Blood Sea coming in, um, the flourishing flats turn into the morning marshes. Um, and the home of most diseases anywhere found on Scar. <laughs> and turn uh, utterly contaminates that by being buried underneath it. Um, so between that and the uh, that coast in northern Termana, the most very, very disease ridden place. So, final battle, final battle of this divine war. Um, and it's pretty much one of the final titans to be taken down, and the last titan who really had any sizable armies is Lithine, or Lithina, um, the titan of wind, of, of, uh, of storms, basically. Um, kind of like seas as well, but it's a titan of storms. Um, this battle, no witnesses. Again, there weren't vast armies. Um, we don't really know what happened. We know the gods fought her. Um, we There's suspect, suspicion that Vangel and Keeley were involved, but there isn't much text on this, other than this was the final battle of the war, and the war pretty much ended in terms of battles beyond you know some random titan spawn running around going, it's over? <laughs> um, I didn't get the memo. Uh, 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so you know, but in terms of major, major god involved battles, um, this was the last one. Um, and how it went down, I, if, if it's in some text, I'm not quite sure where. Um, so it's not mentioned in Divine and Defeated. Um, so there's some room there to find out how that went down. Um, what the one thing we do know is that um, Ankeli and Vangel, who were her two kids, um, trapped her in this vortex that she, like Tholkos, apparently loved because she was placed in this um, vortex that, and there's some contradiction whether it's in Achilles' realm in Limbo or uh, Vangel's realm in the Abyss. I think kind of like uh, my other theory is that it's in a, in a Limbo, tra- like between the two realms mm-hmm. in this vortex that sort of sits between the Abyss and Limbo and sort of the Erland area. Um, incredibly hard to find, incredibly hard to get to. Like only those two gods seem to know where she is exactly. Um, and th- it's said that every once in a while um, they'd go to like the edge of it and look fondly on their mom. <laughs> Not together, but you know, individually. There's because, there, and I don't know if that's the authors mixing the two gods up or just they both do this. But, um, but uh, there was there's that the, the, the two of them sort of guard over her in this in this limbo. But she apparently doesn't want out because she's like, I like it here. It's very it's very chaotic. I love chaotic. This is sort of my things. This is my jam, and she apparently is okay there. At least that's what they claim. She doesn't have a lot of followers. Um, there's some sea creatures called Piskins, but most of them are now following um, Queen Ran and Catam, so who knows? She doesn't have a lot of followers left. Not a lot of effort trying to bring her back. So Aww. she was the last one. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, we have two Titans left um, who weren't defeated in battle. Um, there is Gulthane who's like one of the most forgotten titans i think but i think also one of the interesting one he was um titan who created spirits and he's the one who had uh, his, his senses destroyed by the other titans way 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 back at the beginning um he was bullied into siding uh, arguably was bullied into siding with the titans during the um and he uh didn't fight in any battles but because of his, these creatures he'd made that give him his senses, he used them as spies ported to the Titans and the Titans battle leaders as to what was going on. So, you know, you imagine like a rack dragon out on the battlefield and one of Gulthane's moths comes in and says in his ear, they're on the left, you know. <laughs> so that's sort of what he did. Um, and so they captured him at some point during, and they basically had him sort of in a prison cell <laughs> this whole time and he's not fighting he's <laughs> you know, he's just like he's just like whatever I'm, I'm not gonna fight you I'll just be here um and it said that a lot of the titans when they captured them Madriel, particularly like um with mormo it said with uh any of them and well Madriel wasn't in a lot of fights but but she would go and she would offer them and lovely possibly and and uh Gulliban, she would, which I'll get to in a bit, she would say, I will grant you mercy of death if you surrender. And almost everybody refused, except Gulthane. And now, Titan can't die, so what the hell does this mean? Granting Madriel's mercy. Um, but she would, everyone should, I will grant you mercy. You have this as an option. We don't, you don't have to be in prison. You can be, we can go merciful. And it's like, what the heck is Madriel's mercy? And um, Gulthane said, Okay, I will go with Madriel's mercy, and and all, and all the gods are like, someone said yes. <laughs> this thing Madriel keeps bringing up, none of us know what it is. Either. And what happens is, I'm still not really clear, but what happens is, Gulfain basically Denim steps up and absorbs him, and he becomes like basically one with Denim, and and she becomes like greater Titan because of it, and he's gone, like not imprisoned can't come back gone 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 like as, as no other titan is gone you know, theoretically you could bring back mezos theoretically you could go find the bits of various ones Gulfane is as all all consciousness is just within denim so presumably that's what madriel's mercy is um so that happens and then the very final final one in the in the cleanup crew is our favorite titan Gulaben. <laughs> <laughs> she she didn't do a lot in the war, 
but they knew leaving her around was just bad <laughs> because of the fanaticism around her followers. And, um, and, and apparently this probably took place during the quite a bit because Gulliban is split up across all of basically this conscious wind that exists across all of Skarn. And the way it worked was um, they would just run around and find bits of her and just sort of gather them up and eventually. And uh, Hadrada made these big four massive iron boxes and they would just shove the bits in these boxes. And then Chardin, because he's a dick, um, created these runes outside the boxes to torture her. Because why not, right? Because why not? <laughs> and then Inkili, um, her only her only godchild, her only child was a god, um, helped find those bits. Uh, Inkili and Tanel were the ones who found all the bits. And then um, Corian kind of bound her into these these iron boxes. Madriel did offer her mercy, but she's like, nope. <laughs> Unlike all things, nope, not, not on me. And um, and then Bellsmith and Arios and Vangel went out to find all evidence of her and destroy it. So Arios went into dreams. It's like every dream of it. Goldman, nope, nope, nope. And they destroyed texts of her and, and, and any evidence that she ever existed, wiping her name off the records. Um, and much the same what happened with Churn's Curse and the, the Elf God. Um, but like wiped off not just her name, but her temples and anything to do with her anywhere because they knew anybody had this any sense that she exists they want to bring her back because she's the titan of sexy sexy times and people really loved her and and wish she hadn't gone because you know she was pretty awful but not a lot of because all the lore was lost it's not clear what she did that was right so she caused an ice age we know that but beyond that we don't really know it's all been lost so apparently something bad enough that the gods were like nope <laughs> right, <laughs> and the only the only things that remember basically the gods themselves, and maybe the incarnates, but not a lot of because they can't like a spirit that comes back to life whose memories they didn't erase when they erased things could conceivably remember her, but but most of it's, it's destroyed. So and they took those four boxes and um, and uh, placed them in the four corners of the earth. What does that mean? I don't know. It's a sphere. <laughs> right? I don't know where it is. Um, they're well separated. And I wouldn't think they just put her right next to where they have one of the other Titan bits. You know, it's like, so in this chasm, we have both a piece of Gulaban and uh, and a piece of Golthaga. I don't know. <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, is, is, are they under the earth or the end of the ocean? I, I don't know. But, but four corners of the earth... Is that just a phrase? Is that just... Suffice to say, they're split up in some way. They're theoretically on the prime material plane. Who knows where they are? But this is quite a bit of a mystery. Uh, have fun, GMs, trying to figure that one out. <laughs> and then our last time, of course, is Denev, who participated in the Side of the Gods. Um, at the end of the war, she was really tired, and she, you know, she just ate a titan. So she went nappy bobos, and basically um, went under the earth somewhere on Galspad, um, we know it's Gelspad, but beyond that, we don't really know. And is sleeping. And the idea is that because Gelspad, um, the gods were kind of already handling Ashrak, and it was their fault, not the Titans' fault. <laughs> so um, Gelspad took the brunt of the Titans' fault. So she chose to sleep there to heal Gelspad and try to heal the earth there and to, to purify it of all the Titan viscera. Um, that, that fell there and, and that ruined things there. So she's asleep somewhere and has been asleep for the last 150 odd years since the end of the war. Yeah. And then, uh, and then the gods did some cleanup, put time back, put the planets back, made some new constellations from 16 really cool guys who fought in the war, um, and uh, uh, fixed the calendar, started a new date, and business. And then uh, AV1. <laughs> And that happened, and then a bunch of stuff happens in the next 150 years. But um, that's that's kind of the basic setup, for the campaigns that, yeah. that, that run in the world. Although I, I would I would love to see if anybody's actually tried to run something that takes place during the war, because that would be crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've I've certainly touched on it in my campaign. Um, 
the Seraphic Engine, I think, is fascinating. I've done some really neat pictures. With them. I've touched and played with that a little bit. But um, but I think I think cementing it in that later time, particularly in fifth edition, um, because we're not there isn't that epic scale in the system. Yeah. Um, I think I think that that this is this is what's gone on before. All those heroes died. Um, you know, there's, there's like the handful. Ladwin's still alive somewhere. Um, Yugman's still alive. There's five or six more still alive. But the, all of those major, there aren't a bunch of heroes anymore. So there's all this room for that. There's all this room for the PCs to be new heroes. Yeah. So, um, so much to play with. Yeah. So much. Yeah. Anyway, that's nice. the Divine War in Yay. not a nutshell. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, and we talked about this. It's not really a nutshell kind of thing. I mean, you can no, just say no. uh, the gods with the Titans, but it's not really even that simple. So. No, no, no. It happens. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I love that the vision of just then Keely looking at Lethine and Vortex going, I miss my mom. Right. And then just, you know, <laughs> yeah. and Keely walks away and Vangel just kind of walks up and there's like a little tear in his eye. He's like, I'm not crying, you're crying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, because you can't imagine it was easy right? know, emotionally. Right. Yeah, even. Yeah. Even like some Dude, of the bastard certainly. guy. I mean, some of the really uh, terrible. You know, I, I, th- I think I think killing Churn was easy. I mean, not easy, but I mean emotionally easy. Right. But um, <laughs> but 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 I, some of you know they can. Oh, and 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 another another thing that I like to point out, they they and one another thing the cons did was they created this call, thing called the divine truce, where they said we will never do what we just did to each other. What we did to what did to our parents to each other. We will never do this. We will never face each other in combat. And a lot of that heart of that was during when they were defeating Mormo, Bellsmith and Madriel were both on that battlefield. And they watched Denev rip her sister into pieces. And they looked at each other across that battlefield like, Would oh, you do that to yeah. me? <laughs> Yeah, let's not, because they didn't get along. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and they're like, and so they made this this truce to say no, you know, we will send, we will we will work through our intermediaries, we will work through our worshippers, clerics, and our followers. We will not directly face each other ever, ever. Um, not part of it, and that's like that's written in stone. We will, and we will send our avatars to. We will, we will not leave our divine realms ourselves. We will only send our avatars. And they, they, they locked the doors behind them. They couldn't leave their worlds anymore. They could send these avatars in their place that sort of they could they could experience things through. But the avatars aren't epic level. Well, they're epic level, but they're not they're not god level. They're like, you know, they're about as powerful as those Uber heroes. Right. You know. Vladowin could probably take out an avatar. <laughs> so give me that sense. Like, probably pretty easily. So so the, they sent would send the avatars, but even the avatars aren't allowed to face each other. You know, beyond like a, a shouting match, but they're not allowed to to fight, and they're not allowed to go to war with each other. They have to go through their intermediaries. So, for Duk, on behalf of Chardun, can beat the shit out of the forces of of Madriel if he wants to, but Madriel herself can't. She can, and she can send her avatar and heal people, but she can't go into battle. And Chardun can't go into battle, so his his avatar can just stand in the back and cheerlead yeah. so <laughs> and honestly and yeah sorry i was gonna say so for the first time in like the world's history it's become more an age of mortals than it is at any time before because the gods yeah, aren't yeah. literally walking around on the earth the titans aren't walking around on the earth exactly, fucking with everything exactly. <laughs> yeah and and the gods that are walking around on the earth and actually manage to fuck with things are more the demigods so you're not going to see chardun walking around but you might see Idra, you know, or you might see Arias or Dundari and or Namorga, the god of death. And so you're much more likely to see them putting their fingers in things than um, than the major gods. And also the major gods are busy making doing all the things the Titans used to do to make the cosmos run. <laughs> so there was something Mezos did. Yeah. You mean this shit doesn't just run itself? <laughs> yeah, so theoretically the Titans did something to make everything work. Yeah. And Denov's sleeping, so she's not doing it right now. And so it's up to the eight victor gods to make the trains run on time. So yeah. theoretically they're and they're so they're busy with their divine realms. They're busy making the clocks work or whatever it is they do. Um they're answering their prayers and stuff, but they're they can't be 
going to every you know battle and every wedding anymore <laughs> so so they're not as day-to-day -day involved as they were um and they're certainly not stomping around planets yeah. so so yeah so you know make with that one what you will and then also you know better a little better mapping to like easing off the gods for fifth edition yeah and and fifth edition does not line up and you know my my argument is or my my intent is to fuse these two world these fuse these two storylines together into one you know maintaining as much of non-contradictory information from the original canon and lore merging it with the new stuff that's come in in a sensible way yeah and which is which is a challenge mm -hmm. which is a huge challenge you know we, we we had i mean we had contradictory stuff just within the lore itself when we were writing vigilant um and then to add in concepts like like Oh, the, the, they fight the Ratmen, and oh wait, no, the Ratmen are good guys now. What? <laughs> How does this work? Um, okay, some good of them guys. are good guys. Good I guys. Mean... It's like, uh, <laughs> so, so you have to. They're going to explain all that. Um, so that's going to been one of my intentions with when I, in, in so much as I have any say in any of this, and I'm, you know, I look to Travis to lead this, but um, and to to Rich Thomas to lead this, but to just be like, okay, where, how can we keep the old lore, at least the, the good old lore that isn't nonsensical gibberish, which most of it's good, um, and and merge that with all these great phenomenal ideas coming in from our new creators and from the fans and from the other the other uh, freelance creators. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a freelance creator, so um, there's so many of us out there working with Vault and, and just putting out new materials. There's just something new on the Vault, I think, every month. So it's, it's, it's mind-blowingly awesome. Yeah. Three years ago, I was like, oh, it's practically dead, you know, <laughs> and then and it was dead. And then yeah. it was like, it came back and then and then like the, the player guide and then it was it. And it was like, oh, I guess I'm not doing anything. And, and then, yeah. you know, and then, and then over the last um, couple of years, it's just exploded. And yeah. just have so much it's stuff. definitely been my, my favorite thing to show up in fifth edition just because, I mean, you know, the, the Forgotten Realms and all of that, they're fun. Um, I love Scarred Lands, so it's just awesome to see it come back and and thrive. So I don't know, Faerun's boring. Faerun's <laughs> <laughs> boring. I don't know. Can, I don't know. Just, yeah. <laughs> like I, I don't know the lore as well. I know, and I, I know, I know. Uh, I've learned. I know Greyhawk pretty good, but those are the two that I, that I know. What all yeah. Faerun and and and. It's it's those are the cliche D and D settings, you know. Yeah, it's definitely a very very stereotype. Yeah, yeah. and it's like orcs are bad. Brand says, <laughs> Brand says, where's the blood? Yeah, there's the <laughs> ocean of blood. Yeah, yeah. Why, why are orcs bad? I want to play one, you know. <laughs> and, and like, yeah, let's 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 be more interesting. Yeah. So, anyway. Well, so okay. we will wrap yeah. this one up. Um, join us ideally next Friday. We'll find I, out. I, I, I'm, I'm going to start scraping the bottom. Of, I've got maybe... I'm not sure what to talk about next. Oh, I've got a couple the ideas. The races. The races. Yeah, yeah. And and there's some other history stuff or plot point stuff. And we'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. We can just... uh, Sarah, yeah, tell and, us and, about... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, and also, um, if people have questions, we could even do, like, uh, answer questions. Absolutely. Do so. a Q&A, an AMA. Yeah, yeah. So, Sarah, tell us about yourself and where to find you on the internet. I am Sarah Stewart. I am a Scarred Lands lore master. Um, I wrote the uh, Scarred Lands novel Vigilant, book one through Shadows and Dreams, um, found on Drive Through Fiction. I also have uh, several uh, titles in the Sourcing Vault, including That's Vigilant. <laughs> um, Co wrote that with my, my wonderful wife, Fran. Um, although I'm the lore master, she's just the uh, editor. Um, <laughs> Uh, and uh, we uh, did uh, the calendar for Scarred Lands is also in the uh, sourcing vault and um, a Vigil Watch, uh, written up Vigil Watch, sorry. No, uh, Vigil Training Mission Maritime Patrol. Oh boy, what a bloody ordeal um, <laughs> is out on that. And, and actually, I did discover recently that, and I was like, I, got, I had an awe moment earlier this week when I picked up, uh, uh, actually picked up Vigil Watch, the first. Uh, Book saw that Fran and I had a thank you. We didn't work on it, but we did have a thank you. So that's like, awesome. We had a thank you in the book because Yay. of our massive, massive uh, uh, events list. So we we are 
we're the keepers of the giant list of lore. <laughs> um, so um, there you go. And I am one of the few individuals on the planet who's read every F in Scarlands book. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And I'm Jeremy Hochalter. You can find me on Twitter at WH Pubs or on Facebook, also Facebook.com WH Pubs. Here on Twitch is WH Publications, obviously, or you can go to WHPublications.com uh, to follow the blog and see what new publications are coming out. I have so many things in the works, and it's like one of those things I'm just like throw a dart and see what I'm going to work at today, work on today, because focus is not a thing right now for some reason. No, no, no. <laughs> on another Thorstein Vault item, and I'm just like, this is so hard. Right? <laughs> oh, and because I always forget, you can find me and or myself and uh, Fran on Mondays. Fran on Mondays, yeah. uh, for uh, the Myths and Matchmakers game by Travis Legg, yeah. the Scarlet developer, and there may be a couple more characters joining that campaign oh, soon. Oh. Spoilers! I actually missed this last Monday, so I don't know. I have to go watch the episode before uh, tomorrow, so I can figure out. I was unconscious apparently, so I don't. I didn't really miss much as far as that goes. But yeah. it's a fun game. Uh, it is. So it is. It is. If you fun. can, and I've been watching it, and it is really fun. Plastic Age Plays, Plastic I think. Age Plays. Yeah, is yep. the uh, the Twitch channel. So head over and watch that with us. Until next time, everyone, be safe, uh, have fun, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.